Hello and welcome to another episode of Invalid Entry Advent Edition. It is the 1st of December 2023 and we're going to be looking at some security uh, videos, some shortest videos about security and engineering and computing and things like that. Um, today we're going to start relatively simply on something which I think is well, relatively well understood and also it's very easy now to defend against it, which is SQL injection. In fact, when we look at the OWASP top 10, OWASP top 10 being a, something I've talked about before, about it, 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 there's more than 10 things you need to think about when it comes to security. Uh, in 2017, it was considered the number one issue. Not just SQL injection, but injection in general. And it's actually dropped now to the third position. And I think that's not because uh, these other things are more dangerous. I think it's partially because injection, um, SQL injection, other types of injection attacks, command line injections, they're so trivial now to defend against and they're becoming uh, harder to actually get those things into code because they're easy to find, they're easy to fix. Um, so these are things that your application should not have in it. In fact, when I wrote my application, and here is the world's worst application, we'll just get straight into it. Um, this is a little web app, a little flask, Flasks are not intrinsically insecure. You have to work quite hard to make them insecure. Um, but what I've done here is I've plugged it onto a database. Uh, you make a web request. If it's a get, uh, then you get this login page. Uh, I haven't used the password type field on the form because I want to, be able to see what I'm typing. Um, it is trivial for someone to turn off that so they can see the typing. So. Um, but if it's a post, I someone's to click to submit on the form, then we yank those out of the form. And then we pass them into a query to try and work out whether that user was the right user. We'll talk about password hashing. We'll talk about those in a future episode. But this is just going to build up a query. If it gets one row back, that means it's good. That means that username and password matched. One row, which is good. Uh, and you've logged in. And we return the user ID. We're going to return the username and the user ID back in the display. Uh, otherwise, we're going to just return no. That's in bad. And there's no rate control on this. You can brute force this. But actually, it's much worse than that. You can get into pretty much any account in the system from the interface without any tooling, just with thinking a bit and using the web interface. So just to show that this actually works, uh, I had the Flask running. Um, and I'm just going to open up the, um, the demo here. So here's my username. So I'm going to type JT in. My password for this is super secret password. And it logs me in. Uh, if I didn't know the password, if I was like, I uh, don't know, then it doesn't log me in. So uh, web page works. And this is one of the problems with security is that you can build something, you can work, you can put some tests into for it. Um, and you kind of go, wow, that's my job done. Um, unfortunately, this is horrendously insecure. Uh, before I show you so why it's horrendously insecure and how to break into this um, fictitious page now, I wanted to also quickly show... Um, some of the static code analysis. The static code analysis is um, uh, not even a modern technique, but certainly the tooling has got a lot better in the past few years. And the two tools I'm going to use is Bandit. Bandit is a Python specific tool. It's open source, it's free, you can go and run this against your code. So I'm just going to just run that against that, every, all my Python code here. And it finds a medium, uh, a single medium issue here. It goes, yep. It's a possible SQL injection vector through string-based query construction. Um, Bandit gives you two scores, a severity, how dangerous the thing is, and the confidence. Because it thinks it's a medium-ish type issue. It's actually really a high issue, but it thinks it's medium, but it's only got a medium confidence. Now, I would say the confidence is important because sometimes it will say um, this is a, a medium or a high issue, but it's got low confidence about whether it's actually exploitable or not. So, it's, so this anything which is a medium... Medium either categories need to be fixed, or um, in my opinion, or at least uh, remarked why they're not an issue. Uh, so, yeah, it is, yep, it's found the line of code which is dodgy. Um, and also, if you have Sneak, uh, Sneak is a paid for code tool um, and it works on all languages, not just all the majority of languages, not just uh, Python. So, I can need to code a test. And Sneak actually goes away and does a bit of a deeper dive and actually starts looking at. Um, how variables flow through the program as well. So it's a bit more of an advanced um, application. Um, and Sneak will actually just take a few seconds longer. Um, and we'll come back with three errors um, because it actually finds that 
uh, I've got some hard code, my username and password is hard code in the credentials file, um, and it finds a, another issue as well. And for some reason, it's taking forever to return here, so we'll just wait for that to come back. There it goes. Okay, so the email here has come back with a high SQL injection, an unsanitized input from a web form flows. It loves this word flow, flows into execute, where it's used in SQL query. This may result in an SQL injection vulnerability. Um, so we can ignore the other two for the moment. We'll, we'll, again, there's some interesting issues about cross-site scripting and so on. Um, but yeah, that's an interesting, um, this, the code scanners have found it, they've identified the line, they've identified the exact line. So if you're using Sneak or if you're using Bandit, it should tell you this is something you should be fixing. So straight away why these should be fixed, why we shouldn't have applications with these kind of problems is because your code scanners should be finding it. Uh, other code scanners are available. Um, but let's have a look what's actually going on here. So this is the line in question where you're selecting. And what we're actually doing here is this, it can look weird because the correct, I'll show you how to defend against this in a moment because the defense against this is actually like one character difference, um, which is kind of crazy. But what this is basically doing is it's making a string. So it's going SQL equals, oh, don't want to come marks, this string. I'm doing percentage replacement. So I'm dropping the username into there and the, and the password into there and then I'm executing that SQL. Um, and on the basis of that, it's, it's not, not too tricky. The moment we start doing more complex, you've got to think about every single SQL query you might write on your website, um, you know, all those uh, paginated views and filters or queries, things like that, where you might build up queries. All of those get a lot more complicated as to how you might build these strings up. Um, but fundamentally, we're taking a variable, we're not validating, we're not doing any kind of validation, and we're just slapping it into this string. So no matter what this string builds, um, it's going to work. So to attack this, um, what we're going to do very quickly is have a look at um, um, what that's actually doing behind the hood. So if I'm just going to basically just run this up very quickly, I'm going to make some assumptions. If I had absolutely no knowledge about the database, I'm going to assume that there's a table called users um, and that there is a, a probably an ID and a username on there, probably a password or pass field or something like that. Um, so what's actually happening here, if I actually, I'm going to mock some code up really quickly, um, which is going to look like, so I'm just going to run this well to actually give me a curse on the database. So this was going to look like, so I'm going to select the username for the database, uh, I'm going to print my SQL off, so we actually see what the SQL being generated actually is. Then we're going to run it and actually give us the data back. So we're going to simulate this web page here uh, without making lots of web requests. Um, and actually, I'm going to put in my username, in a name equals JT, and my password equals super secret password. I believe that was my password. There you go. That worked exactly as intended. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger for you guys to see what's going on here. Um, oh, that's the wrong way. Right, so as you can see here, the SQL query is making a syntactically correct SQL query. Um, but what we can start doing now is we can start messing around with this. So why don't I put nothing in there? It then starts making a query which um, is still correct, but we're starting to mess around with this a bit. So well, actually, what if I put a single quote mark in there? Um, this begins to get more questionable because if I put a quote mark in there, it's going to have three quote marks in a row. Um, so I could just start commenting out uh, the rest of the line. There you go. Um, and that, that it's still erroring because there's no rows. Um, so I need to make it actually work. So I could say or 1 equals 1. And all of a sudden, I've gone from instead of having ever zero rows found to zero, two rows found. And the reason for that is when you look at this query, this is syntactically correct. It hasn't escaped that quote mark here. So basically, I've said password is equal to nothing. Or what want. But what actually is happening is the or is happening after the and. So it hasn't, the way SQL, or way in this case, the rear behind the scenes is calculating the precedence here, is actually a problem. Um, so what I can do here is still go, oh, username equals JT, like that. Um, in fact, at this point, I can just give it that comment because it's going to end in a quote mark. And there you go, I've now logged in as JT without knowing JT's password. But maybe I don't know what the admin user is. It's a fair bet, these sequential IDs. Maybe I've got a user account and I can see my ID, like user number 427. See it's, and maybe I've got two user accounts, 
or I know a friend who's got a user account, they can see the user IDs by some other metric. And so I may know the user ID of the admin, or I can guess the user ID is, is what. I could maybe go ID equals one. Uh, but I've got that training quote mark here because one is a number, so I don't want to. If I run that, they, this this is not. I've got I've got too many quote marks. It doesn't look right. So again, I want to just reintroduce a comment. I even put a semicolon at the end to make it really nice. Bit. And there you go. Without even knowing. Oh, sorry. Let me get rid of my username up here. Uh, unknown user. Uh, and there you go. I've logged in as the user. And just to check that actually works, we can now go back to the login page here. I'll just go unknown user password is going to be quote mark or id equals one semicolon hyphen hyphen space uh, and the space is important by the way uh, i ought to point that out because actually a, a a comment if i took the space out and ran it uh i get an error but i put the space back in i don't get an error and that's because the the query at this point that's no longer a comment minus minus is not a comment minus minus space is the comment um, in MySQL and Maria, and I think TSQL as well. So you do have to know the type of database you're targeting, you, uh, but um, it doesn't take long to guess. Most people use MySQL or MySQL variant, or they're using Postgres, or they're using TSQL because they're on a Microsoft database. So, you know, it's one of those, not many. Um, so yeah, uh, space in the end, and then I submit, and I've logged in as myself. That is SQL injection in a nutshell, or kind of the worst thing, because I've just assumed the admin account without knowing the admin's user name. Um, and I can then go away and create another user account and do whatever I like to the system. Um, they can be a lot more subtle than that. They can be, because you've got every single query, every single parameter, every single part of your web page, every preview you ever do, uh, you have these kind of uh, queries going on. So they can be a lot more subtle than just the home page. Uh, sometimes you can say, look, this is a page which only admins can get to, um, and therefore an attack can only be carried out by an admin. Uh, but the problem is, is if you're doing it in a way which um, you never know if that page might get published in a different way later, or that function might be published a different way later. So if you're doing it in this manner, it's just a bad idea. And now to fix it. Now, that's the this mission here is that we know there's a mistake, we've seen it's exploitable, how do we fix it? And the fix is actually not that hard. Um, the fix is to use um, parameterized front queries, okay? And, and it, it's actually rather simple. Even with the SQL being generated, uh, what we do is not pass in the username, but put a question mark. And we put a question mark here, we put a question mark there, and we don't use a string replacement. So the SQL um, is, it, it, it's a, looks a bit weird. But here, I pass the parameters of username and ID. No, I don't have a password. Uh, and it doesn't know what I'm talking about because it's parameterized. And that's it. That's the fix. Um, it, it, when you actually see it in the code again, so if I was now to do this here for real, um, the SQL, put the SQL back into the actual thing. So it was. So it originally looked like this, which is fantastic. I'll comment out a second. Put it underneath. So instead of using that, I'm going to use um, pass it as a second parameter. So this is now um, the parameters I want to pass. Now these are positional. Um, I'm going to put a question mark there. I'm going to put, there are extra things you can do in parameters query. Put a question mark there. Save that. I actually have to restart my. Um, Flask because it is a flask. I do have to restart it, um, which is fine. And if I go back here now, I can put um, at super secret password, and it still logs me in. If I try my um, my hack, which I'm just going to copy this here, or id quote mark id user one, and it doesn't let me log in anymore. Um, and so in the code, you can see that the, the actual fix, the difference in the fix is, and so percentage, I'm using these question marks, and percentage of a percentage here, I've got a comma. So the actual delta between the incorrect line, the horrendously insecure, but still looks like it's working line, and the correct line is, I said one character, because I was thinking about this is, this is the character which makes a difference. Um, that, that, say, actually pass these as a parameter. 
you might be tempted to say, actually, I can do this. I'm clever enough to do this. I'm clever enough to actually escape those. So I can sit here and I can go, actually, I'm going to do uh, where there's a backslash. So I can do, oh, um, username dot replace um, uh, quote with a backslash quote. So I can escape those. There are a lot of subtleties when it comes to SQL. Uh, there's a lot of things I can now do which aren't single quotes to still escape out of this. Um, as you get into more and more complex queries especially, there's even more things that I may be able to trick the system we're going into. If I have a copy of the source code, it makes life even easier. I can find these very fast. I've got code scanners. I can run the code scan and say, oh, look, that's where there's an SQL injection possibility. And I can then manufacture something to pass it through multiple layers to inject. Injection here is is I'm, I'm modifying, I'm injecting into the query. Uh, I'm not necessarily injecting into the database. A lot of people think SQL injection is injecting things into the database. It's not, it's injecting things into the query to make the query do something that the original programmer did not intend. Um, and in a nutshell, that's it. It's a very simple thing. To go beyond this, I would start looking at things like if I was in Python, and this is true, by the way, this is true in all languages. Okay, so if you're writing in Python, it's true. If you're writing in Java, it's true. If you're writing PHP, it's true. All these languages have in their database connect to prepare and execute type functions. They can pass parameterized queries in. Um, SQL Alchemy um, is a absolutely awesome thing to use. If you're not using Django, if you're using Django, you use the ORM and use models, and that does all that SQL for you. Don't write any SQL at all if you're using Django. And the same for SQL Alchemy. The idea is not to use... Um, uh, not to use SQL, but actually to use models and objects, and then actually, um, here we are, ORM examples, and then start actually um, building up your what your object looks like, and actually having it generate the SQL for you correctly, and then user input, including things you've generated, get um, stripped by uh, the thing. And it may mean that you can actually end up, if you ever actually start inserting things into the database and people are starting to attack, you actually end up with values in the database, which are the SQL. And that can lead to other forms of injection. Um, but as a very simple thing, if you're going to be writing SQL in scripts, which allow any form of user input, not just websites, you've got to think about, um, I think the, the, the weirdest ones we've seen is people have actually put them into company names, knowing that the company's house publishes a list of these company names. And then they, other people ingest that list from the company's house because they say data from the company house is good data, it's from a trusted source, but that's been an SQL injection through or an injection attack through. Uh, we've seen, um, yeah, I've seen Slack bots. I've seen Discord bots. I've seen people do it via chat messages, uh, Telegram bots, um, WhatsApp bots. All those things are, are vulnerable to injection attacks. Where the, anytime I can interact with that, pass data into it even if i pass that data in via intermediate i can send dodgy stuff to it so escrow injection as i say it is the most um trivial thing to find your static code analysis the bandits the sneaks the jits of the world will find them and then you fix them um start scanning start fixing make the world a safer place uh, that's what it comes down to um, and hopefully this was helpful. I hope you enjoyed this. If you do, there will be another video tomorrow for the 2nd of December. And I hope you all have a Merry Advent.